It's September 24th, 2013. My guest is Galen Sharp, the legendary Galen Sharp. Hi, Galen. <laughs> legendary, huh? Well, <laughs> well, you know, before Hi. I finished with you. <laughs> Hi, Jerry. It's, it's really nice to talk to you. Thank you. Same here. Can you just do like a brief introduction to yourself, just a minute, because the whole interview will kind of be an elaboration of it. Well, uh, these days uh, I, I do a lot of sculpting since I retired and uh, uh, also uh, some writing still. I like doing that. Uh, a lot has uh, been in the way of, uh, you know, promote book promotion right now. But uh, I, uh, I go back, way back, I was uh, born actually in Denver, Colorado, but I grew up in a small town in Oklahoma, uh, right in the Bible Belt. And uh, that was a really good place to grow up. And uh, uh, we finally moved back to Denver when I was uh, starting high school. But uh, by uh, different, different means, I ended up... Uh, hoboing around Europe for a couple of years when I was about 18, 19 years old and got a great education that way. Uh, I uh, had led a pretty sheltered life and it was really good for me to have to take care of myself and uh, learn how to uh, uh, do the things I needed to do to stay alive and uh, and, and kicking. Uh, I, uh, I didn't uh, make much progress though on my main search and that was I was really looking for a, a philosophy of life uh, and how to be happy and uh, it was it was uh, uh, disappointing that uh, I guess they, they say you know wherever you go you take yourself with you and your problems and that was about it uh, I did I did learn to be more self-reliant, but I still didn't find that magic philosophy of life. Yeah. There. So now you you write about what happened to you at the age of eighteen in your book, and it's a great description of your trip to Europe and everything that happened to you. And I want to I want to get into that. In your book, you um, of course a lot of it's based on the teachings of Wei Wu Wei. We'll be getting into that. Mm -hmm. but you also quote the the New Testament or the Gospel of Thomas. So you mentioned you grew up in Oklahoma in the Bible Belt. And how much of an influence was a Christian upbringing? Well, uh, most of the kids I was in school with were children of teachers at uh, a local uh, religious college. So it was it was all around me. Then, uh, but I really didn't, you know, understand much about it. I had uh, picked up, you know, the the morals and attitudes and etc. Uh, and uh, we all uh, dutifully went to Bible school when we were uh, children. But uh, you know, I, I really didn't understand Christianity. I, uh, I I knew certain things were right and wrong and that sort of thing, but uh, we were uh, went occasionally every Easter to church, so that was that was about it as my religious upbringing. Now your book, by the way, is "What Am I: A Study in Non-Volitional Living," and it's published by Tendava Press. And the website is tandavapress.com, and then you have your own website, galensharp.com. That's right. Well, you mentioned the Gospel of Thomas. Yeah. Uh, did you want to... Uh, uh, I have an interesting story about that from Wei Wu Wei. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in one of his letters, he uh, revealed to me that he used to be an Egyptologist. Uh, I don't know how many people uh, knew that, but in his early life, uh, he was an Egyptologist. He didn't tell me he, he did plays and was a playwright and that sort of thing. I didn't learn that till later. But anyway, he said he was in Egypt and uh, a colleague brought him a, uh, a, 
a manuscript that had been found, a papyrus, something like that, he had just found and uh, gave it to uh, Terence Gray, uh, Wei Wu Wei, and uh, asked him what he thought it was. Well, after Terence uh, looked at it for a while, he said, uh, it looks to me like this is the words of Jesus. And uh, that later became known as uh, the Book of Thomas. Is that right? Yeah, apparently he was the first one. So, of course, I ran out and tried to find one uh, as quickly as I could. Uh, the best I could find was a book on why it isn't uh, uh, truly uh, the, uh, the writings of, or the words of Jesus by uh, uh, showing where it, uh, it paralleled certain things and that, that was, they said, just a copy and where it didn't parallel it, they said, well, this is obviously nowhere else in the Bible, so it couldn't be right either. But I found it uh, actually referencing uh, the non-duality that I later began to, to study. And uh, in working with Douglas, we really never talked or used the term non-dual hardly, hardly at all. It wasn't really known uh, as that in those days. Excuse me, this is Douglas Harding. This is Douglas Harding you're referring to? No, no, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, way, way, Terrence Gray. Terrence Gray, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did I say Douglas Harding? I thought you said that's the name Douglas, the first name. So I thought you said that. So I was just... Oh, oh I, I could have. I'm <laughs> sorry. Okay, well, we're going to talk about all these people. But I want to... Uh, yeah, go. So so continue with what you were saying. Well, that's about it. Uh, I, I uh, of course, look, looked it up and found a lot of the things in the book of Thomas to be very Zen-like. Hmm. Uh, uh, lift up a stone. Uh, I am there. Chop wood. And there I am different phrases like that, which uh, you really don't find in the Christian Bible, but uh, were in the book, book of Thomas, and uh, I found it very intriguing. It's said that during Jesus' Jesus's missing years, it's suggested, and there may even be evidence for it, that he was in India, you know, roaming around India and studying and learning, and he was known as a sage uh, in, uh, in India. Yeah, that could be. Uh, at this point, I really feel that Christianity, as he was telling people or, or preaching, uh, uh, was non-duality. And uh, because I find that at the heart of all of the, quote, true, uh, close quote, religions, uh, it's all pointing to the non-dual as far as I can see. So uh, I think when uh, the Bible was canonized, of course, a lot of the Gnostic literature was excluded from it, uh, not all. And uh, that's where you would, you would find those references, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a whole other thread to this conversation to, to investigate that. I do want to talk about, um, you know, there's different strands of, of, of your life I want to cover, so it, but in, in the overlap. Oh. Uh, so part of it, part of one of these strands is like your own personal journey, which really started around the age of 18, it, thing, it seems. And then another strand is your relationships with these people that you know. We, we've mentioned the way Wu Wei. And a third strand is, yeah, is your book and your writings. And... Um, and a fourth strand is your work as a sculptor. So I don't know how we're going to bring all this uh, together, but maybe we should be somewhat chronological. And we'll get back into Wei Wu Wei. He's very important. I want to spend time with him. But how about what happened at age 18 to you? People want to kind of probably want to know what, what happened. What happened to you? Oh, yeah, that I write about in my book. Yeah. Uh, yes, that uh, uh, I was... Uh, actually still very disillusioned with the world. A lot of teenagers are. I think they they look for 
you know, they, they might ask the question, maybe even subconsciously, what am I or who am I? And, uh, of course, don't find anything there. And that's why they uh, put on all of these affectations and, you know, go goth or something like that because they feel like they're not anybody. Well, uh, I kind of felt that way and I was real dissatisfied that, uh, uh, you know, things wouldn't go my way a lot of the time. And that's what I was looking for, a way to see the world and understand it. And uh, I would, I'd been drinking a little too much one night and uh, uh, I tried to end the day by writing a little bit in my diary and that's where I wrote, uh, uh, you know, uh, I thought I was coming up with a brilliant thought that I can uh, never be happy unless my ideals become a reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I thought about it a little bit and thought, well, there there is a way to turn that around, although it doesn't sound possible, and that is until reality becomes my ideal. And uh, let it go at that, because I, I, uh, I really hadn't thought and didn't for probably a few years later uh, that uh, reality could become one's ideal. And you started asking questions. Yes, uh, it uh, brought me uh, a few years later after uh, I'd married and uh, succeeded at a few of the things that, that I really wanted to succeed at. Uh, I was an artist then and uh, uh, I was uh, art director at a national uh, agency, although nobody knows her knows that they did have national accounts and uh, they had what sorry they had national accounts yeah uh, but it's not one of the biggies but it, anyway I, I had uh, you know done illustrations and uh, had them kind of published and all of that and uh, I had come pretty far along in my career but I still wasn't happy, and uh, that's what kind of brought me to begin to question uh, who and what I was, because uh, I began to think, what's it going to take to be happy? And as I thought about that uh, at each level, you know, if I possessed this or was that, uh, would I be happy and come to find out that I'd have to uh, keep increasing that until I realized that if I were the ruler of the world I still couldn't be happy because things are going to go wrong and uh, uh, things are not going to go my way all the time and uh, uh, that was a real big disappointment to learn that uh, uh, basically uh, I uh, Unless something drastic happened, I never could find my way to happiness. And uh, that's what uh, kind of started me on that search as to who and what was I. Uh, I'm not sure how it turned into what am I. Uh, I can't recall it right now, but I became, uh, became fixed upon that so that... All, that's all I could really think of because as I would look for myself, I tried first philosophically to answer that question and uh, found no answers and then began to look internally to answer that question and uh, uh, find a self somewhere. And I just couldn't. There just wasn't, there wasn't anything I could say, well, this is me, this is myself. And uh, till one day it, it did dawn on me, uh, it was kind of a magical moment that what I knew as myself was only a concept, it was only a thought, an idea. And that really opened up something and relieved me of something because then I realized that I'd been a slave to my self-image, to my uh, self-interests, to all the things that I thought I needed to be happy. And uh, that really 
cut me loose from a lot of those kinds of things which most of us, you know, do worry about a lot of our our lives, uh, you know, what our self-image is, how we look to others, uh, how we, uh, are we thinking the right way or whatever it is, uh, have we succeeded well enough in our business or so many things like that figure into our self-image and I realized uh, in just a moment of, of clarity that that wasn't who and what I was. It was just a concept or a group of concepts. And that's what led me to further research uh, different religions, different ideas uh, that had that theme to it and that finally brought me, because it's just not available really in mainstream literature. And especially when you were doing that, just for some perspective, like what years was was this happening, this inquiry? Uh, roughly. Well, uh, let's see. That's nearly fifty years ago, Jerry. Okay, uh, so that uh, I was I was in my early twenties. So. Uh, yeah, it would be almost that. Early 60s. So, okay, so you were saying, um, yeah, so you were searching religion and it wasn't mainstream. I mean, it's, it's hardly mainstream 50 years later. And I think the only person That's at right. that time who would have used the word non-duality maybe once in one book it would have been Alan Watts, unless you were studying, you know, academic stuff. Yes, I did. Uh, actually, I, I became more involved in Christianity when... I saw certain things in the Bible, such as uh, you have to lose your life to find it. So that so that stuff started to make sense. Yeah, it started to make sense. Uh huh. So and, you uh, thread. Okay. But uh, when when I talked to other Christians, I was uh, off on a different uh, plane that they were. I was in a different direction, and uh, I, I couldn't relate to other Christians, although I felt all right, uh, then, then I'm a Christian, and I, uh, I still didn't know what I was. That was one of the problems, and that wasn't until way, way, uh, his, his book uh, came to me. I was at a, a little bookstore downtown Denver, and uh, it was hardly bigger than my room here, but up on a way high on a shelf was a thin little book called All Else is Bondage. And I pulled that down, why I'll never know, and opened it up and there it was. Uh, he was saying the things that that I was looking for answers to. How did you feel at that moment? Wow, you know, that that's, that's an interesting question, Jerry, because uh, it, it it's like after you've looked for something really important to you that you've lost for a long time and your eyes first lay, you know, lay, lay on it, you, you look and you realize, oh, this is it. And uh, it's this sense of release. Uh, they call it, uh, I guess, the pearl of great price or something like that. It's like finally finding something you weren't really expecting to find but had been looking for all your life and that's what it what it felt as best as I could put into words at the time it was a long time ago but uh, uh, yeah a great sense of hope would be a good word to put on it so of course I bought the book and took it home and uh, there were other books to uh, by the same author and uh, one of them was uh, posthumous pieces and when I saw that book I thought oh gee I found somebody that could help me and now it looks like he's dead yeah. and uh, uh, that's uh, that's part of the other story that relates to uh, 
Paul Rents that you might want to talk about later. Oh, I love I I never I never don't know anything about him really, but I've loved a couple of his books more than Ah, that. yes, Zen Flesh, Zen Bones. And there's another one I have, and maybe that's it, but I don't know. Um, I have a signed copy. I meant to bring it up so uh, I could uh, uh, show you on Skype. You'll probably have to edit that out, but I, I did. He signs his name, Reps. That's all he yeah. put, and the S goes way up like a sail on a sailboat. <laughs> yeah, well, he signs his uh, different drawings that I've seen. Are they drawings or poems? I'm not sure. Oh, oh, could be, could be, yeah. I think it's in the books. Um, okay, just, just, just going back a little. So you had this, you were on the search, you are asking, what am I? And you came to some resolution of it. You know, you realized that who you thought you were was just these concepts and so on. But yes, still, just, a, just a fraud, uh, you know, that had, had been enslaved to me, basically. But what's... You know, there, there's something that fuels someone to do that search. Not everyone does it. And mm -hmm. you weren't living in the Internet days where everybody's, you know, all around you. This had to be like a real solitary venture or adventure. Well, it, it was. It was. Uh, I really didn't talk to anybody about it. Uh, it was just something at the core of almost everything I did, it was always there, and yet it was unspoken. And, uh, you know, how do you talk about a thing like that, really, to uh, normal people? <laughs> uh, you, you, you can't say, uh, you know, I don't know who I am, I don't know what I am, though. Maybe they'll lock you up or something, but uh, uh, it, it was really a nagging, persistent question to me, and uh, uh, until I found that uh, the self I thought I was was nothing but a fraud, uh, that really plagued me. But of course, it it led me to uh, uh, you know other questions that didn't that didn't solve it all. There, there it was mostly intellectual at that time, uh, but it did relieve a great weight from my shoulders. I mean, I felt I felt giddy for about six months after that. Is, I mean, can people do that in these days where you're so surrounded with this type of information? In other words, in your, if you were going through that now, all you would have to do is Google, uh, Google, you know, your feelings, your emotions, your, your questions, and you get a thousand answers. And, mm -hmm. you know, 10,000 people, you could talk to about it. I wonder if that's helpful or if that just creates more confusion. Mm, I never thought about that. Uh, yeah, it, there are so many people claiming to have answers these days and uh, what, what I hope comes across in my book, not that I'm claiming to have answers, but that I'm claiming to have questions that you can ask and you can research and you can look for and maybe uh, suggestions on where to look and how to look because <clears throat> as we both know uh, what we are is nothing we can um, convey verbally uh, to someone we can't just tell them that it, it does take a personal search and your book it really is built on these 11 what you call reality meditations and you know, I'm I'm seeing that this interview really has interview really hasn't even begun. I really haven't even gotten into what I want to talk about in a way. Um, but your eleven reality meditations really are each one is like a series of questions for the most part or considerations. And something I like about the book is that it's it's you. You know, you this guy who was searching back at you know before the internet days. <clears throat> And just solely on your own, it was just you. And then you met up with uh, Wei Wu Wei, who was who is uh, you know not too many people know about him. He's he's an, another legend. And uh, in those days, I don't know, hardly anybody did. Hmm. 
you know, uh, and, and he he wanted it that way. He that's why he used a pen name. Um, yeah. Um, so let so let's uh, talk about Wei Wu Wei. So so you you found his book, and then and then it was uh, it was actually Paul Reps that connected you with him. Can you talk about that? Maybe talk about Paul Reps and. Oh well, bless his heart. Uh, I, I really didn't know Paul Reps in those terms. Uh, we had, uh, uh, back in those days in, in the 60s, my wife and I had really sort of ended up running a, what we called a Christian community. Uh, you know, there were a lot of hippies and street people in those days and uh, uh, a lot of experimentation with uh, different ideas uh, as well as different drugs, but uh, uh, we went to a meeting in Boulder, Colorado, which is not far from Denver, and uh, it was a Sufi group and did some Sufi dancing and uh, Paul Reps was supposed to be there and I really, I really didn't know that much about Paul Reps and uh, <laughs> he's, during his uh, Suppose talk, uh, after we uh, had done some Sufi dancing, we all sat down in a big circle around him. And he spent the next hour to an hour and a half showing us how he packed his rucksack. <laughs> and that's all he did. <laughs> I thought that was great. Uh, uh, he just he just put everybody on and... Uh, Everybody seemed to like it. Pardon my cat in the background here. Uh, anyway, uh, afterwards, uh, I got a chance to talk to him, and there was a friend of mine with me too. And Paul Reps is really a small guy. Uh, I think he might be Irish. I don't know, but uh, uh, like uh, way way way, Terrence Gray. Uh, he's very small, uh, very short very tiny, but we got to talking to him, and my friend blurted out, how'd you get enlightened? <laughs> and uh, that embarrassed me. I thought that's, you know, that's just too true, blurting that out there. But I expected some uh, high lofty term or uh, talk from him, and uh, Paul Reps said, luck. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. I, was, I was just thrown for a loop. That really... Uh, that really discouraged me. <laughs> yeah, well, discouraged us both. We just looked at each other, my friend and I, and uh, and that's when I I broached uh, that I'd been reading a book by uh, Wei Wu Wei. Uh, did he know anything about it? And he says, Oh yeah, uh, his name is uh, real name is Terrence Gray, which was a secret at that time. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> I said, Oh well. Uh, uh, what happened to him? How did he pass away? And he says, oh, he's, I just came from his house. He's still alive. I was, uh, uh, I was visiting with him not more than a week or so ago. And so uh, I said, do you have his address? And he had it right off the top of his head. He gave me his address and I wrote it down. And that was the, uh, I mean, you look at all of the uh, little things that had to connect together for that to happen to me. I often look back amazed and uh, uh, that's when I began to correspond uh, with Terrence Gray. Or, and and that, that seems like one powerful word just to say, you know, to say luck. <laughs> yes, yes, I, I understand him now, uh, but uh, uh, I, uh, I certainly didn't at that time, and uh, uh, when you process it all all the way through, I guess you know that's uh, that's a pretty good answer. But uh, mm. at that time, uh, I wasn't ready for it, and it just mystified me and knocked me for a loop. But uh, those are the kind of things that can stop your thought process uh, uh, a moment and maybe sometimes uh, open some things. Uh, I know that uh, uh, 
Douglas Harding also uh, knew Paul Reps, and uh, although although uh, I don't know if you want to get to this right now, there's a funny story about Douglas Harding and Paul Reps. Yep. Do you want to segue to that for a yeah, second? Definitely, yeah. Okay, well, uh, uh, Terrence Gray, way, 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 had connected me with uh, Douglas Harding, and Douglas was coming to the U.S. and uh, wanted to uh, uh, visit, so he stayed a, a few days at, at our home, and we got to talking about Paul Reps, and he says, oh yeah, that guy, and uh, I said, well, what, uh, what's the matter with Paul Reps? He said, well, he called my, my, uh, my, my uh, teaching uh, uh, a one-trick pony, he said. Uh, he, he didn't like him, and, and uh, well, he didn't say he didn't like him, but I could tell by the way he said it. And then he said, uh, you know, he was visiting me the other day, and uh, he didn't like my English cooking. And he went out in the front yard and he pulled grass up and ate it. <laughs> and he just said that he was just really disgusted. <laughs> and of course, of course, it just cracked me up because, you know, I, I, I'd seen him and kind of knew a little bit uh, what he was like and thought, you know, he, he just really uh, was putting Douglas on. And uh, I, I wrote that to... Terrence Gray about what Douglas had said, and he said, "Yeah, he's like uh, the use the word I can't remember, but it, it meant uh, like an elf whose whose coattails swing around and knock things over." He said, "He's you know he's kind of impish and uh, uh, a, a bit of a a, a trickster sometimes," and uh, so I took it at that. I, I know there must be lots of stories about Paul Reps that are along those lines. I've never heard them though, and I've never known anyone else who knew him. But uh, uh, obviously, he and Douglas Hardy weren't the closest of friends, but uh, they uh, they certainly knew each other and certainly shared. And uh, I don't know if you remember the magazine Mountain Path. I don't know if they're still publishing or not. By uh, the uh, ashram that Ramana Maharshi lived at. Yeah. And, and the, the beautiful part of that is uh, Paul Reps and uh, Wei Wu Wei would write articles sort of back and forth uh, trumping the other one's article before that, and they called it Dharma Battle. And uh, uh, one would write an article, uh, I wished I could give you an example, you know, stating some truth or something, and then the other would write an article that sort of took that and bettered it. It's, it's called the Internet. That's what it's called today. <laughs> it's, called, it's called a non-duality group on the internet. That's all. Right. <laughs> and uh, I think you're right, Jerry. I really think so. But I enjoyed that very much because, you know, I had, had something to do with both of them, and I anxiously awaited uh, my my copy from India every month or every quarter. I'm not sure. Um, now, now, Terrence kept telling me to write something for them. They needed a uh, writer, sorry. Terrence Gray kept saying I should write an article for, uh, now this was many, many years ago, for the mountain path, and I was so intimidated uh, at, at that time. You know, I was nowhere in the sphere that these guys were, in you know, from my, my point of view, and then in reality, too, I... You know, I had just caught on to a few things and knew kind of the, the, the basics and had made some discoveries. But, you know, I was still growing, ripening, and had a lot to do. But uh, it, it did flatter me at the time that Terrence kept saying, you've got to write something for the mountain path. 
uh, although, uh, of course, I never did. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a down ending for that story. Now, um, at some point, um, before I get further into Wei Wu Wei, I just want to, uh, anything else about Douglas Harding when he stayed at your house? you have any good stories for us? And I know you use some of his, at least in one of your reality meditations, uh, you use one of his uh, methods that, you've, that you revised. Which yes, was, and uh, he had, I, I owe a lot to Douglas Harding because uh, he had some good inquiry methods and uh, intuitive research methods, and he freely shared them with everyone and everybody. And uh, I also have written a longer or a workshop to go with the book uh, for uh, a 14 week one. And we use uh, at least one other of his uh, uh, experiments in there. And he had a group with him that they, they all worked together to try to come up with things to further clarify what we are and, you know, to further the investigation. And uh, so uh, he was an awful nice person, very unassuming. And uh, I had a book there that, uh, I don't know if you remember in those days, uh, Talil Gilbran was a famous uh, mm -hmm. Uh, writer of supposedly heavy things. Well, I had a, I had a book written uh, to spoof him called Kellogg Albrand. Oh, yeah, really? Yeah. And uh, Douglas found that book and he started reading it, and he would laugh and laugh and laugh. And there were things in there like, uh, uh, "Oh, Master, speak to us of fate," and uh, the Master would say, "It's I see long." lines of camels in the desert. I see many ships support and went on and on. And finally, one of them said, well, Master, what, what has this to do with fate? And he said, fate? Oh, I thought you said freight. <laughs> right. And uh, oh, Douglas loved that. He thought that was so funny. And I gave the book to him, you know, when he left because he was still enjoying it very much. But uh, he did have a good sense of humor. As I find most people uh, in the non-dual movement, uh, you know, you almost have to have a good sense of humor because, uh, uh, you, and you have to enjoy riddles and that sort of thing, I think. Uh, but uh, it does help a lot, and uh, we had a lot of laughs together, and uh, I, I can't say enough about Douglas. Uh, as far as other stories, Mm. He was just very open always to share, and uh, he, he would say things uh, like, I think I mentioned in the book, like, uh, I never know what I'm going to say next, mm -hmm. or I never know what I'm going to do next, yeah. and things like that, that uh, were always, you know, you always wanted to listen closely to what he was saying. I didn't know you had a, this one, one thing I wanted to ask you, um, really toward the end of the interview, but but this is a good time to say it because you mentioned it, and that's, uh, I mean, when you read your, when someone reads your book, the first thing they want to know is, are, is there a workshop associated with it? Can someone, uh, you know, how can someone, you know, really get into the book through some kind of contact with you? So, can you talk about that at this point? Oh, well, um, of course, suggested on uh, a website that Tandava Press set up, is a just uh, the, the bare bones of going through the book chapter by chapter. Uh, the problem is I've I've written uh, a 14 session course that uh, I still haven't given yet. It was uh, structured on an earlier course that I used to give years ago on much, you know, on the same subject, actually. And uh, as of now, I don't have a venue for doing it. I'm looking for a place uh, in the Denver area, if somebody happens to be listening, to where uh, maybe once one night a week for a couple hours, you know, uh, 
we, we could do this. And uh, my first uh, group would have to be an experimental group in case, you know, certain things had to be rearranged, mostly time-wise. Uh, and I'd love to do something like that, but it hasn't actually started yet. Uh, you know, the the book is still pretty new, and uh, I I really, you know, don't know how many people would be interested in doing that. Oh, I think people will will be interested. Uh, yeah. You have a you know a unique unique background and perspective, and like I said in my review of your book, that I think a couple of times I mentioned that you're seasoned, and I like that word. It really applies to you, seasoned as far as this whole non-duality game. Oh. Well, I appreciate your uh, your review very much. Yeah, you're welcome. I was yep. I was knocked about by that. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I've read it again prior to this interview, and I've read it more carefully, and uh, it's like a whole new reading. So that's always a good sign. <laughs> uh, it, um, so there, I mean, there's um, sentient publications in Boulder, of course, published all of Wei Wei's books. And that's Connie Shaw. Who knows? Maybe she would uh, do something. She's in Boulder. Well, I actually did uh, a foreword for one of them, uh, Ask the Awakened. That's right. You know, I have all those books here. Yeah. Oh, do you? Oh, yeah. Uh, sure. We talked for when I when I first wrote my book, uh, I I looked at one publisher who was going to publish it and then not, and then Connie Shaw. Uh, after someone referred me as a person who could write a, uh, a forward, uh, she asked if I had anything written, and we were talking about publishing my book for a little while, but uh, that kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, it just uh, sort of ended. Uh, I never got back to her, and she never got back to me, and... Uh, I think I was a little reluctant uh, to to uh, to actually publish the book, not because I wanted to keep any secrets or not, but uh, I wasn't sure what it would entail as far as uh, my my personal life and that sort of thing. Uh, usually, I, I wrote a book many years ago and nobody noticed it, so I shouldn't have been worried. <laughs> Well, these days, you know, you can get. It's not that hard to get uh, get some publicity out there. Um, let's see what I want to cover next. I actually made a lot of notes for this interview. I do a lot of interviews. I never make any notes. But for years, I have several pages of. <laughs> and I keep getting you mixed up. Uh, yeah, up around. It's jumping around. You know what? I have about six pages of notes. I'm halfway <laughs> through the first page, so I may have to do several interviews. Uh, yeah. yeah, but I have enough, We could do a week of this. Uh, we could. We'll do as many as we have to. It's great. You know, I I have about till about two thirty today, but we'll, we'll let's do it again. You know, so <laughs> put out one and then we'll we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah. Someone I want to ask you about. We talked about Douglas Harding. Way 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 is yet to be investigated further, and the other person I want to talk about is is um, Peter. This really interests me because when I came on the internet in 1997, I wanted to do something with non-duality and I wanted to make it fun. I wanted to make it accessible. And mm. the only person who had a website up was this sentient.org, which no longer exists. Uh, people can access it through the Wayback Machine on Google. Uh, mm. And I saw what he did, was doing, a, he had a list of teachers and some writings fr from them. It was dedicated to Ramana Maharshi, the website. Mm -hmm. I later found out that the person who ran it was named Peter. And But um, it was sort of what I wanted to do, but I wanted to do something. I didn't want my website dedicated to Ramana Maharshi or anyone. Mm -hmm. I did it more expansive, but he inspired me, showed me what I could do. And he was the first one on the Internet, as far as I know, who had a list of non-duality figures and teachers and apparently he started it as a bulletin board in 1992. You were one of the first people on that site and I always thought Gail and Sharp, you know, who, who is this guy? Kind of like, I don't know, maybe you wondered about Wei Wu Wei. So mm -hmm. who was Peter? 
And he was your friend, apparently, because you he was, sent he, your he, he, he was a personal friend. Uh, uh, I'd been to his house before, and I mean, he'd been to our house uh, once or twice, I think. We, we corresponded quite a bit. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, his last name was Reese, I guess I told you that, uh, but unfortunately, I've lost touch with him. He had, uh, he believed in riding a, a three-wheel bicycle uh, wherever he went, and he rode this bicycle, and he had two or three accidents with it and acquired some brain damage, and uh, he was a real expert at Computers actually had one of the first networks set up in his own home, and uh, this made it eventually impossible for him to to keep his his website. And the last time I uh, got a word from him was he took, said it it took him three hours to. Uh, read and respond to my uh, email that I sent to him. And that just tore me up. Uh, I hate to share such bad news, but I thought, you know, I just I just can't put him through that because he was having such a hard struggle. He always did have health issues uh, for many years, had different health issues and uh, but uh, he lived up in Canada. He was a Canadian. Uh, he was married to Jill, his wife, which I knew also. And uh, uh, he would sometimes just want to come up and stay a few days with us. And uh, I had a, uh, an office at that time. Uh, the only place we had was on the floor of my office, and he'd bring a sleeping bag. And, sleep there and uh, the it, it was a surprise to me that my article ended up there because I just sent it to him uh, just for his own um, you know for for his own interest I had written it just actually for myself to see how succinctly I could state some of this uh, stuff that we talked about and uh, I'll be darned. He had put it on the uh, the website, his his website, which he had maybe uh, ten or fifteen others on there, including Douglas Harding was one. I don't know if you remember others. I also gave him some writings of Nasarga Dada to put on there too, because uh, I I really felt he was. Uh, you know, someone who should be quoted. But uh, that's the sad news, and, and I, to this day, I don't know. Uh, you, you could maybe find out. Uh, he lived, uh, trying to remember at that time, maybe near Vancouver, but I, I could be wrong. Well, no, he has passed away. This is. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah. Um... A okay. friend, uh, Vicki Woodyard, I don't know if you've come across any of her writings. Oh, no, no. Oh, Vicky, dear. Um, yeah, Vicki had a correspondence with him, and in fact, she's having a book published based on her correspondence with him. Uh, you know, he wrote a book. I I have it. Uh, and uh, he, he wrote a book, Peter? Yes. Peter How do you spell his last name, Galen, by the way? R-E-E-S-E. -E -E. Okay, that's that's what I thought. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, well, that's about it. He, he wrote a book. Uh, in fact, I think he had a quote or two of, of mine in it and sent it to me. It was, he called his, uh, it was self-published, I believe, called it Laughing Monk. Publications or something like it's that. Here. Uh -huh. I wonder if it's online somewhere or it it might be. Uh, and I could I could certainly loan you my copy if I could find it in my uh, my tons of 
books. I think some people would want to see it anyway. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, yeah he was he was very kind and generous person. Uh, I, uh, you know, really really had affection for him. His his wife Jill learned to fly. She was inspired by a trip I took. I had flown years ago and. Uh, I, I sent her a picture of me standing by a, a, a biplane uh, that my wife had gotten me a, a, a tripium for my birthday. And I said, you know, this is something on my bucket list. And she, uh, Jill, thought, well, gee whiz, I've always wanted to do that too. So she took a flight and ended up getting her pilot's license. <laughs> But uh, her, her, both her and Peter were ill with back problems for a number of years too. So uh, they they had a hard time. What was Peter's uh, spiritual spiritual adventure like? Uh, that's hard for me to say. Uh, he he probably was more widely read than myself even uh, and uh, he was a computer uh, a computer expert in that he even he even wrote a computer language uh, a very brilliant person when it came to the technical side of computers and worked for uh, I believe it was a university or college in in that area as far as his his spiritual life he feels that he already had this insight or intuition when he was uh, he could remember when he was a very tiny child and uh, this had always been something that was with him and uh, so we would we would try to discuss that and everything and uh, was always very respectful to me. I don't know how, quite how he looked at me, uh, uh, other you know, other than friends and that sort of thing. But uh, his spiritual life was mainly grounded in those writers that is on his website. There were other people involved with him too on the website, but I think that was would pretty well show his background. Mm -hmm. You would have enjoyed knowing him. I had a couple of uh, very, very brief emails with him. One, once his website was down for several weeks, and, oh. and I wrote, and he just said he, he said he had a stroke and he couldn't do anything with it. So I think I wrote him back, and, you know, and, and he never... We never had a correspondence, but mm -hmm. yeah, in correspondence, but meaningful. That must have been around the the, the time that uh, I stopped hearing from him. Also, uh, he had a website uh, his own that was that was set up too. I, I forget what he called it. Yeah, but uh, yeah. I had uh, I had done some writing on my book uh, when we were still corresponding, and he said that he could put it online uh, if if I wanted to do a digital thing of it. But I wasn't I wasn't finished. In fact, it was uh, the replies that came from that little article that I wrote that encouraged me to go ahead and try to explain things more fully. And it was and it was brave of him to put someone like you were an unknown and he put you on his website. And you know, again that kind of inspired my own work that someone could just could just do that and just put down something you know, not worry about whether someone's famous, they're just they're communicating. Something yeah. And it, it was obviously just because he liked it, and yeah. uh, I was as surprised as anybody. That probably took courage in those days, you know, <laughs> something like that. You know, it takes courage even now to, to, not so much now, but 
when I started on the internet. It, oh. it, you know, to just take ordinary people and and, and um, distribute their their emails because there was some some truth to it, and to call them self-realized or put them right up there with other well-known teachers was was radical. But I enjoyed doing that, and I see that Peter did that too, and maybe he inspired me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it, it was just a very key. Uh component to the book that I have out now, uh, you know, a real encouragement to go ahead and write it because cause so many people, I guess, wrote to him and asked if I had a book or, you know, if there was anything more they could read. And unfortunately, I didn't have anything, you know, I'm, I'm not a writer. Uh, I did write a book years ago, but uh, that's, you know, about all there is to it. I, I take notes, you know, and uh, that's uh, about all I do nowadays. Hopefully, uh, some of it will come together again and turn into something. Who knows? Well, you have um, a good publisher, <clears throat> good publisher, David Rivers, and, the, and his wife Natasha Rivers, and uh, you had a, a good editor. Um, Mm-hmm. as well Tony Cartledge who yes Tony you know. did an excellent job of, of editing and he didn't really fool with the book much I had thought I needed to to shorten it a lot I know I say a lot of the same things over again but I keep trying to come at it from different angles yeah it does it works that way yeah yeah uh, because I, I know how hard it is to get past the what I call in the book mindset, uh, because there had been so many things that I was, I was just totally blind to at first, such as when you find out there's not a self. Uh, the obvious next question is, well, how does that affect my volition? But uh, it took a long time for me to connect those two because my mindset hid it from me and it's just a logical step. And that's, so now we're getting into, into the book itself because it's about um, non-volitional living and how would you like to find that or, or you know, maybe define, voli- well, volitional living, I think people <laughs> have a sense of Although people listening to this, you might have a sense that you you have you have free will, but everyone kind of knows that that, mm-hmm. that there's something else going on. Yes, it's really simple in terms, you know, if you look at it the right way, if volition really worked, you could lead the perfect life. Right, you can you can will. Yeah, you you know what what you ought to do, and you do it, and we. We think we can do that. I mean, we go to Sunday school or we we go to some uh, seminar or we do this and they tell us, you know, how to live a better life and what we should do. And we think, by golly, that's it. Makes a lot of sense. That's what I'm going to do. And uh, find out that it just doesn't work that way. And that's very mysterious. It's, you know, like some... Uh, I, uh, I'm trying to uh, guide a stubborn mule around that you know, keeps going the wrong direction, that sort of thing. And I think there are some uh, Zen uh, sayings that relate to that, the volition being like trying to tame a bull or ride a bull. So. Uh, you know that there's something wrong, but the idea of not having volition is so darn scary that it's almost impossible to approach that because in our simplistic way of looking at things, it just means then that we're predestined somehow. And until you can see the impossibility of 
being itself, then you can begin to see that there is something uh, which is living your life that uh, beats your heart. That you know you don't know how you walk. You don't know you don't know how you talk. You don't know how you see. You don't know how you do all of these things, and and yet you just do them. And there are uh, being a Christian, there are lines like it is in Him and whom you live and move and have your being. And that's sort of sums it all up in terms of the fact that you you don't have this uh, free will that you think you do. And the next step is to say, well, then uh, I just don't do anything. Is that that right? I just sit down here on the couch and uh, let things go by. And I... I kind of challenge people to try and do that if you can just do nothing uh, you know it that's pretty uh, pretty hard to do that uh, you'll, you will spontaneously find yourself living your life and it's uh, some other power that's at work within us that you know we haven't become aware of until uh, we begin to look into these things Mm-hmm. It's so hard to define because the mind jumps to certain conclusions. I cheated off of you to a copy of the note in your book, quoting you, non-volitional living is simply realizing that right now, at this moment, you are neither doing nor not doing. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. so you talked about doing, you talked about trying to sit on a couch and not do, but... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That uh, in, in the end, you do realize that it's impossible uh, to do either one, to do or to not do, and that that's not happening and never did. Yeah, yeah, this, that, that was a good note you took there. How does it, how would you feel as an author? I don't know how much you've been interviewed. How do you feel about people like quoting you and saying, uh, you know, you said this, uh I mean, does that, uh, you know, does that kind of remove remove things from the moment, or what do you think about that? Oh, no, I don't mind as long as they get the quote right <laughs> and uh, spell my name right. No, I, I, uh, I'm teasing about that, but uh, as, as long as the co- quote is correct and in context, certainly... Uh, I, uh, there are probably a number of things in the book that can be taken out of context and, uh, you know, just by themselves don't look good. But, uh, no, it's, uh, uh, to the, to the sentient being Galen, uh, that's rather flattering to be quoted. Okay. I mean, my wife never quotes me. No, I don't know why wives never do that, you know. <laughs> I just think you're an ordinary person, which is unless it's something really stupid. <laughs> no, she's she's much nicer than that. I, I'm, I'm sure. Have you, have you been married a while, you guys? Or uh, fifty-two years. I fifty-two believe. years. Fifty-three. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, over fifty years. Yes. So uh, uh, she's the saint uh, when you when you look at it that way. Uh, she's yeah. the saint of the family. She's I don't say because um, you know you do sculpture and I've seen some of your models and uh, you know I mean on the cover of your Facebook page uh, like who's that blonde come on oh <laughs> yeah 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 she's she's one of my favorite models now in fact uh, I'll have to I'll email you uh, my uh, latest sculpture with with her I've got a I've got a drawing or maybe after we're through with the interview I can hold it up to the screen I don't know but uh, yeah I it's really funny it's so many of these things in my life that uh, turned out to be uh, wonderful things is sculpting and when I first retired I was looking for something to do, and I thought, oh, I'm going to make a koi pond in my backyard. 
and uh, give me some exercise and uh, something to do and something to, you know, I researched it, figured out what it took, what you needed to do, and I, I dug it all. In fact, there's a pond and a 20-foot stream and then another little pond at the back. And I got that all done. And as, as I was finishing up the pond, I thought, gee, this really needs a sculpture of a uh, uh, water spirit or something here to watch over the fish. And I looked around and looked through the Internet different places to find a sculpture and just couldn't find anything and I figured it needed to be about three feet tall which which was half life size and uh, I had been an artist you know in my earlier careers and done some illustration and I thought well my golly I'm just gonna make one mm. and little did I know what I was getting myself into because uh, I wanted a you know a real uh, bronze sculpture there and I, I had no idea what it would cost either so uh, that was quite an adventure the, my first one took me three years hmm. to finally uh, actually have up out in my pond I think there's a picture of it in, in on my website somewhere the the pond with the sculpture the sculptures is that wife, it's not the bronze is that a, at your website galensharp.com yeah yeah, that's one of the uh, pictures that go through there. But I, I found that, that it was, sculpting is, is very zen. You're, you're very into the moment. Like I tell people, I, I, I know I did this sculpture, but I don't remember much about exactly uh, how I did it. Because you're... As, as you're as you're forming the figure you know your hands and the things your tools all that you use are you're very much in the moment as you're shaping this and it's kind of growing under your hands and I never had even in painting oil painting that sort of thing I never had that much satisfaction in doing something and had that much satisfaction when I was finished as far as you know liking what I did I always had some issues that it was never quite right and of course I see flaws in my sculpture but uh, for some reason maybe it's, you know where I am now it's okay it's you know what it is and I found that that's just very pleasurable for me as well as very expensive uh, to, to do to get the mold made and uh, to get the uh, bronze casting. What, what, what material are you sculpting in? What do you? Sculpt? I sculpt in uh, oil clay. I build a, a uh, armature, and sometimes I put a little foam over it so it won't become so heavy. And uh, then use oil clay over it. And oil clay doesn't uh, dry out. Uh, some people use water clay, which becomes hard. They prefer working that way. But uh, I use I use oil clay because I uh, kind of slow, and I'll leave it for maybe two or three weeks and come back to see if it needs anything different, or you know some something that your eye gets used to. I don't know if you've ever drawn or done anything like that. Uh, no. But uh, uh, if, if you've done artwork or anything like that, Jerry, your eye becomes accustomed to the flaws, the things that you've done wrong. You may have your eyes not quite level, and your eye becomes accustomed to that, and you don't notice it until... You look at it, you know, two or three months later and think, oh, my gosh, did I really did I really make a blender there? So I, I don't want that to happen in bronze. So that's why I uh, sometimes leave it a little while. Look, at, you hold a mirror up to it, that sort of thing. I imagine it is an expensive uh, 
you know, it's more than a hobby, but yeah, they, yeah, yeah. They, they look from what I've seen from pictures. I mean, they, they look beautiful. You know, I mean, the sculptures and where, where, when they're finished, where do you what do you do with them, or where do you place them, or? <laughs> There are a lot of them standing around our living room right now, and yeah. uh, there, there's uh, people are overwhelmed when they walk in, yeah. <laughs> and uh, others downstairs and others in my studio. I uh, I'm either going to have to find a place to put them, or sell them, or uh, I'll be glad to sell them, uh, or uh, uh, stop doing it altogether <laughs> because I'm running out of room. <laughs> Well, and, and are they mostly human figures? Yes, they're all, uh, right now, they're all uh, water spirits. And the challenge that I had in doing them, I, and I kind of just came up with this for my own, is, uh, I, you know, I feel the female figure is, is the most beautiful thing in the world. And it uh, just by itself has great beauty to it. So the challenge was first to make it so it looked good from all angles, uh, wherever you walked around it, and also that it didn't need uh, clothing or cloth or anything frilly to sort of help help it, uh, you know, with some rhythmic flow. But it would all be just the figure that would do it, and that's quite a challenge. And I don't always achieve that. However, uh, that's what I look for when I do it. Now, now what what uh, constitutes a water spirit? You know, why would you call something? What's what's a water spirit? Well, it started out to be a fairy, but then I got to the wings, and I thought she doesn't need wings. All she needs is pointed ears, and so uh, that's what I did. I gave her pointed ears and left off the wings, uh, sort of, a, I guess you would call them naiads or uh, there's one other term that is for water nymphs, uh, something like that. There's different, different words and mm. different names for them. And I just came up with water spirit to oh. kind of uh, label them for my, you know, communication with people. I don't know if I'll keep doing them that way or branch off into something else. They're all all half life size. Although I do have some that are quarter life size too. It, where do you where do you get them bronze? The any place locally in Denver? Or? Well, uh, I'm very lucky that uh, up north in Loveland about an hour's drive are uh, people who do molds. I was going to do my own mold, but I realized how difficult. Uh, that's a whole science in itself. Oh, yeah, you got to get a mold. Okay. You got to get a mold made. And that's uh, different kind of things, uh, different kind of rubber. Some are silicone and some are uh, some other kind of, of rubber. And uh, the, the mold make, maker actually cuts your work apart to make the molds so that uh, the furnaces can take them for one thing and because uh, most the, the foundry I use there takes up to a two foot square is all they can they can cast at one time so you need it cut down and you also need to cut it down sometimes just in order to uh, you know get get it out of the mold so you take it to a mold maker and get a mold made and then take the mold to the, uh, the foundry and uh, they dip it, the, the mold, which is a, a negative, dip it in wax and let the wax dry on the surface of the mold just a little bit and then pour it out. So then you have a positive uh, of that piece of the sculpture. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you, you're you going to probably have to cut all of this out. But then they uh, they actually coat it, uh, dip it uh, up to 10 times in a, a liquid that, that hardens as a ceramic. 
and that's uh, that's got that wax inside. So when it comes to casting it, they heat it, and the wax runs out. That's why it's called lost wax casting, and they pour the the bronze in it, and uh, then they have your sculpture in several pieces, which then someone also has to weld together just perfectly and just right, and then someone else has to uh, uh, clean it up and smooth it up and take all the welding marks out of it. Uh, then, uh, then it gets a, a patina of whatever you want to use on it. And that's, uh, those are all things I had no idea of when I decided to go ahead and make my own sculpture. So it sounds like there's at least three uh, different artists involved in the uh, in the uh, in the process. Yeah, they're they're all artists. The, the people who work on it, and they have to be. Uh, a lot of them do their own work, their own sculpture. Yeah. And, uh, there's a, a show in Loveland once a year. We go to, and that's about the only place I've shown them so far. And uh, they take. Uh, People, you have to apply and they have to ask you to come and show your sculptures. And so once a year they have that in uh, Loveland. Loveland is sort of a place where sculptors go. And uh, so there's a lot of foundries and mold makers in the area. Interesting. So, yeah, well, that's nice. You're, you're, not, you're not far from, from, a, from a sculpting uh, capital. It is really. Uh, they have a lot around town. They have a lot of sculpture, you'll see, and they're you know very kind to the artisans there in that area. They uh, a lot of businesses try to feature a sculpture, and they're in the parks and that sort of thing. That's great to hear. Thanks. Um, yeah, we're gonna have to do another interview because I, I really, I, I sort of want to go through your book, like each of the reality meditations, and just kind of ask you about them. That, huh? might, that might take a little while. Well, again, getting back to Wei Wu Wei, how how would um, you compare him to like Ramana Maharshi or you know Robert Adams and uh, some of these other people in the Sargadatta Maharaj, who you mentioned earlier? Mm -hmm. it, it, is he considered right up there as far as a self-realized sage, uh, or is this something you're you're not up to comparing, perhaps? Well, no. To me, he is. Uh, I, I his method is is a different. You know, in reading him, I'm sure you have. Uh, he uses uh, uh, a lot of unfamiliar words, unless you're. Uh, yeah. A scholar. He's hard to understand. <clears throat> yes, he is. Uh, but that has advantages to it because yep. your mind is going in different directions and sometimes gets stalled altogether. Uh, and uh, uh, he he's able to say exactly what he means. And uh, I feel like I'm really compared to him. I'm really sloppy uh, when it comes to. Uh, you know, using terms that are uh, very exact and that sort of thing, because he never did. He was always very correct in his use of language and, uh, you know, always had this sort of sense of irony. Now, I, I think he had his spiritual awakening possibly when he was at uh, Ramana Maharshi's Ashram, he seems to indicate that 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 was for him uh, the the defining time in his life that he was at the the ashram there uh, with Ramada Maharshi. So uh, he always used him in the examples and everything. And one day he wrote to me and said some friends of his from America had sent him a book about uh, Nisargadatta and he hadn't heard of him before and uh, he has asked me to get a book and 
tell him what I thought of it. Well, of course, I was very flattered because uh, way were way asking me what I thought of, you know, this uh, other thing. But uh, when when I did find his work, I think it was I am that. Uh, I uh, I was very impressed, and he was also like. Terence Gray, I felt a kindred spirit with him, and the way he, the way he expressed things, and I think that's very personal to different people on on the path here. That there are certain people who speak to them in terms they identify with, and other people who may be just as correct. We're talking about how uh, people, yeah, how how people. People respond to certain teachers, and other teachers can be just as correct and and have the same message, but it doesn't, uh, you know, uh, work on a, a certain personality, a certain type. You can understand, and uh, I suppose that's how you choose a a teacher. Find someone who it makes sense to you that you begin to resonate with what they're saying. And that's that's what happened to me with Terence Gray, Wei Wu Wei and Nisargadatta and others now as you begin to uh, ripen a little bit and uh, become more comfortable, you're able to see in other people's writings. Uh, I, I heard a line from a comedian the other day uh, was just real fast, uh, and uh, I could tell from what he said, and he was being funny. But what from what he said, he knew what he was talking about that that uh, he had had an awakening of some kind. Who was that? Do you remember? I'm trying to think of who it who it was. Uh, Recently on Facebook, uh, people like uh, Russell Brand and um, mm. CK, um, mm. even Robin Williams was mentioned. As, uh, and so, but, but that's interesting that you were talking earlier about how so-called self-realized people, you know, you have a sense of humor. You, you have to have a sense of humor because of the paradox of everything. Mm -hmm. It's also the other way now, the comedians, like you just noted, the comedians are sounding non-dual, the non-dualists, <laughs> and, and there's a nice meeting happening. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, that is true. In fact, uh, there was a, uh, this has nothing to do with non-dual, but uh, uh, early in my life, I went to a Bible school for a short time, and there was a fellow who came out of that who became a famous comedian yeah. uh, he he w wasn't making as a good preacher and he had this epiphany and ended up uh, uh, a comedian but his his life ended tragically but uh, yeah I, I think there's a lot of parallels and uh, I can remember arguing with the uh, editor of my book I had a line in there from Lewis Carroll uh, tr describing non-dual uh, not, or the yin yang symbol uh, duality is kind of like uh, the mythical island that uh, uh, where everybody earned a precarious living by taking in each other's washing. Yeah, and <laughs> he said we can't put that in there. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> and I said, well, no, it, it doesn't make sense, and that's why I want it in the book. <laughs> And we well, went I, around. I, I around. Made sense. I had to read it a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, and that's always been a favorite remark of mine. I think it was Lewis Carroll. Yeah, that uh, that's what it all seems. All of this seems like to me. Uh, everybody taking in everybody else's washing. <laughs> it's sort of uh, you call that my life philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, when I read that, I, I had to read it a couple of times, and I had to um, Good. mull it over a couple of times. But I liked it, and I thought it made sense. Good. Yes. I, recently, I recently wrote someone an email where I think I used that. Yeah. It made sense in whatever context I was writing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but 
But if you try to try to describe it, you know, it's sort of uh, like like time. Uh, if you try to break it down and say why why it has meaning, you just can't do it. <laughs> it you know, it's, uh, it's nonsense. But uh, that's what I think certain types of government are too, are like. But we won't get into that, will we? Yeah, we're creating activity to uh, keep an economy going, but yeah. we could get into that. And um, at some point in your, book, in your book, you do, you do get into sociological aspects. Oh, I, yeah, briefly. At the end, you know, you just don't, you just don't spend a lot of time in it. But uh, you do mention, you know, social implications of non-volitional living. Um, mm -hmm. um, something I want to ask you about is um, killing the ego. Like you're not like that's sort of a thing, you know, with Internet non-duality. Maybe it's fading a little, but there was a little time there a couple of years ago where, you know, everyone had to kill their ego. And it was <laughs> it was a mess and it was, you know, you're going to suffer. And and, and and that's certainly the case for some people. It has to be the case for, for some people that are so tightly wound and, you know, a lot of a lot to take apart. But I mean, is it always the case that you have to kill the ego and that this is. <laughs> a horrible experience for everybody, or, or what? Well, you know as well as I do that. Uh, then, uh, if if you do kill the ego, you gotta kill whatever killed the ego, and uh, that's never ending. Uh, you know, that's that's the the self to kill the self to kill the self, and uh, infinite uh, regression. I think I might ex have explained that in some way like Zeno's paradox where you can't shoot an arrow to a target because first it has to go fast halfway and before that halfway and before that halfway to there and, and so on uh, infinitely uh, that uh, I, I never first of all I never wanted to do that and I never really knew how you would do it uh, try to pretend you were selfless uh, you know, that doesn't work uh, hmm. very well. I mean, you might be able to put it over on a few people, but it doesn't do you any good. Yeah. It scares most people. But uh, it also scares people when you try to tell them there isn't a self. You have to kind of sneak up on them and okay. have them look for it first. What good? What good does it do just to tell people that there's no self, or um, unless you know, unless it's so obvious to mm -hmm. that you want you want to tell people, hey, do you know what you are? Do you know what you really are? Mm -hmm. And you just want to say that, but I don't know. I don't know if it matters. You know, I mean, people, we are. I mean, what is is. So yeah, very good point. You know? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll ask people sometimes, uh, see if they can find a self. That's what uh, Terrence Gray would do, way, way, way. Say, you know, look, look and see if you can find one. And if you do find one, uh, shoot it and stuff it because you've found a rare bird indeed. <laughs> well, that was, you know, that's his thinking. Yeah, he was very creative and... <laughs> Like you said, very precise, very precise, and um, precision made him a little uh, you know, hard to, you know, abstruse. But mm. uh, and, and, and so something I like about your book is that if you're going to get into Wei Wu Wei, you know, someone should read your book first. I think. Oh well, that's very kind of you to say that. That's a real compliment, uh, really, because in many ways I, I weighed whether to dedicate it to him, I, I felt so indebted to him, uh, but yet I didn't want to dedicate something that people would say, you know, that's a disgrace to his name or something like that, you know. And uh, uh, yet I wanted to share what, what he helped me to understand yet in my own way, in my own words, and uh, there's, you know, a lot that I've added since then, but uh, 
in you saying that uh, is wonderful to hear because I would hope that uh, it's something that he would have appreciated had he still been around. You're, uh, you have, like I said, you have these, each, each chapter is a reality meditation. And as I was going through, I mean, some of the chapters, I mean, each person is going to be struck differently by each, by any one, but mm. any single chapter is, could be worth the price of, of the book ease very easily mm. because of what you can gain from it. And you explain something, you know, better than I ever got out of way, way, I mean, in, in, it comes from the, um, it's an explanation of part of the uh, Diamond Sutra. And 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 um, you talk about first generation and second generation symbol concepts. So a first generation symbol concept would be like chair or hot. And, and if, if I'm if I'm understanding this correctly, you know, correct me if I'm not. And the second generation symbol would be like the opposite. So hot is a first generation symbol. Hot and cold is a second generation symbol. And with every generation, you're getting further away from. You know, uh, from actuality. Pardon? Further away from actuality. Yeah, actuality or, or just perceiving or whatever mm -hmm. you, you would call it. The perception. And, and, yes. And then you say um, something that, that described better than, uh, than Wei Wu Wei did regarding the first generation symbol. I'm just going to read from your book. Um, is, we, Okay, um, we have interpreted the active living flow of the present perceiving into an empty dead simple symbol concept. That's mm. first generation symbol concept. Mm. You're right. In other words, a thing. Mm -hmm. so, something becomes a thing. Mm -hmm. Then you say you may describe a hot, a hot cup of coffee or a, a cup of hot coffee, but you have to personally experience hot to know what hot is. Mm -hmm. Hot is not a thing, but a subjective sensation known only in consciousness. Thus, hot is not hot. Hot isn't hot. Therefore, we call it hot. That is one of the hardest things to understand, like from the Diamond Sutra. And I don't even think Wei Wu Wei elaborated on it as well as you do. Oh. So, so thus hot is not hot, therefore we call it hot. And then you go further to explain, you say hot, the concept is not hot. In other words, the actual subject of experience. Mm -hmm. The concept is, is doesn't have temperature. Mm -hmm. Therefore we call it hot in order to communicate it. Mm -hmm. So the word represents the concept, which represents the actual sensory experience. Mm -hmm. And you're right, so simple yet so difficult to communicate uh, but you really explain that whole thing, you know, something, you know. The, the, I think you, yeah, that, it was difficult. Uh, I know exactly what you mean. It was difficult for me when I first heard that or, or read it. Uh, I'm sure it was like, what do you say? <laughs> when, when, when you explain it, it's easy. Yeah, well, yeah, how can you not get it? But it's, course, it's, yeah. it's hard to get. Uh-huh. Well, it's, it's like... Uh, non-duality itself, you, you know, uh, once there's this glimpse, uh, you wonder why why it wasn't obvious all the time. Uh, you, you might have gone through a lot before you finally looked in the right direction. And uh, you look and you say, oh, of course. You know, that's what this is. And uh, what, what was the one of the Chen masters? I don't know if, if that was it or not, said uh, you can't step in the same river twice. And uh, the other one said you can't step in the same river once. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, those are things that make no sense until you begin to see what, you know, this whole business is about it. And it, it is a funny business. You do need a sense of humor and you do need a sense of, uh, well, a sense of adventure, which I always had. That's why I probably uh, tried to have a lot of different experiences 
in my life uh, and for the professions. Um, can we talk again soon? Well, I appreciate you've been very kind in your interview and uh, very patient with me, and I, I appreciate it very much. And you've been very generous. I'm enjoying it. I've never done any two part interviews. This may go to three parts. Who knows? But <laughs> as, long as, you do, as long as you don't mind. But uh, so we're no, I, no, I know. We'll, we'll change the name to the Galen Sharp Show. That's good. I just want to, yeah, I just want to announce we're speaking to Galen Sharp, and your book is what I am uh, the theme song. Huh? I'll need a theme song, though. We'll get you a theme song. We'll get you some, you know, belly dancers. and. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I appreciate it, Jerry. And yeah. uh, until then, uh, you have uh, a good time. I really appreciate your time and just everything. And Same here. Uh, we'll be talking to you probably later in the week. Okay, look forward to it. Thank you.